Well, hello there and welcome back. My name is Stephanie Safarian and you're listening to episode 215 of the Sustainable Minimalist Podcast, a twice weekly show about intentional and eco-minimalist living. On today's show, we are discussing why movement matters. These days, our kids are moving less than any other generation in human history and indoor time and screen time has replaced those outdoor movement opportunities. This week I'm speaking with, uh, excuse me, this week I am speaking with author and biomechanist Katie Bowman. In her new book, Grow Wild, The Whole Child, Whole Family, Nature Rich Guide to Moving More, Katie argues that, and I quote, movement is currently counterculture. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to ask her all about that. Today we're discussing why movement matters as well as hopefully offering you tangible ways we can reclaim movement opportunities for ourselves and for our children in a culture where frankly, convenience has taken away a lot of those movement opportunities. Katie, I'm really thrilled to talk to you today. How are you? I'm good, thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming on. Why don't we start by you introducing yourself? Who are you? What do you do? And how did you find yourself so interested in reclaiming movement opportunities for ourselves and our children? Well, um, my name is Katie Bowman. I am a biomechanist. And just for those that don't know, it's, it's a field of science that usually sits within kinesiology, the study of human movement. So biomechanists study uh, the physical forces of living systems. What's the impact of physical forces on living systems? So in the, mo in the human movement world, it would be um, what is it about the way that we move and the, the physical environment that affects our physiology, our health, um, the way I'm, I'm interested in how we develop. And oh my gosh, my road to it was long, um, but I've been doing it for a long time. It just happened at university. I stumbled into the program because I always liked math and physics, but I also liked movement. And I found regular math and physics sort of boring, but I found movement um, really interesting and exciting having gone from being a sedentary person someone who just really read and sat around a lot I grew up that way and discovering movement around 17 or 18 and it made me feel so much better than I had felt all the years before so I got into studying that and then um, you know I've worked with adults and figuring out how to fix their physical ailments, how to teach how your physical ailments really relate to your environment. You know, so many of the diseases that we struggle with are diseases of lifestyle. And then I have two kids. I have now um, an almost nine-year-old in a week and a 10 and a half year old. And so I really was able to raise them. You know, I'm sort of a science nerd in this way. I was able to raise them in sort of an experiment of, what would a movement intense or a movement rich environment look like and how, what skills would they develop being placed in that type of environment? And so we changed really everything about our lifestyle to facilitate uh, movement, um, which also ends up being quite nourishing in other ways. And so I wrote Grow Wild, this book, because I thought so many people are struggling to figure out how to add more movement, how to balance technology, how to eat more nutritiously and how to live more eco-minded. And I thought, well, more movement is really a single way to get all of those things at once. So I wrote that book to show um, a, a lot of solutions by making very few changes. Hmm. Well, thank you for correcting my pronunciation, biomechanist, not biomechanist. <laughs> tomato, tomato, it's the same thing. <laughs> Well, I did mention in the introduction that children are moving less than any other generation in human history. And your book offers a lot of facts and figures and holy moly anecdotes to support that. Could you just give my listeners a couple? Of which? Of how and why children are moving less today in 2021 than they have ever before. Why is that the case? Well, I mean, I think that one, we... Our, can, our culture overall has really, it's been stepwise, but we've gone to, we've gone to something that's much more industrialized and less DIY. So if you think of like, where, where does movement come from for humans? It really comes from moving for the stuff that we need. And so, you know, if you have to get up every morning and 
find food. So there's people on the planet right now who subsist in nature. And so there's where they are research populations where a lot of understanding of um, sort of baseline human activity comes from modern hunter gatherer tribes. Um, and so you can see the movements that go into populations that wake up and are foraging and processing food and are nomadic and are moving and building shelters along the way. And so that's, we, many humans have stepped away from that lifestyle. Um, and we've all done it at different rates, but in really industrialized nations where a lot of work has gone to machines or outsourced labor, you've, with, with that, um, outsourcing or with that transition away from a very um, human one-on-one -on -one to the things that you need, we also got rid of a lot of the natural precursors to movement. So why do humans and other animals move? We move because we, we um, have a catalyst for some sort of reward at the end of that movement. So when we've gotten rid of the reasons for moving, I mean, you can like our smartphones now, if you think about what we can get on them and we can have food brought to our door, you can search for a house, you know, you can find a shelter, you can find a mate and it's all been replaced with, with a single swipe. And so when you look at that biomechanically or even anthropologically, what you see is like, oh, so many of our human needs haven't really changed along that human timeline, but our ways that we go about meeting those needs have radically changed and they've been changing over time. You know, humans have gone from hunter gatherer to agricultural centric humans, you know, over, you know, 16,000 years, it's been a long time, but then with industrialized revolution, you know, that's just a few hundred years ago. And then we got a computer and then we got a handheld computer. So like what we care, what our kids carry in their backpacks has more technology than what, you know, NASA used to have for its, people working, like launching the spaceship, right? So, and it's exponential. And so what we're seeing is this exponential ability to create technology, but we don't have a lockstep way of really assessing the impacts of it physiologically. So for parents, that could mean, um, like, how do you even assess? I'm interested in devices for for their biomechanical nature. Like how do they affect us, our steps per day, our, our posture, um, you know, like that really mechanical way. But there's people who are looking at like, well, what about the media types that's on there? How do they affect psychologies? But we haven't even begun to really dig into the effect of technology um, as fast as we're able to create it. So, so there's just that um, difference. So it's just really simply that. I mean, there's a lot of examples of it but you could, um, the way that I wrote the book was by environment. It's, you know, what is, what is modernity's impact on culture and then the food we eat and how much work goes into the food. Most people don't grow any food or even, it used to be like, we all used to grow food or forage for it. And then there was a falling off where people would buy whole ingredients that other people farmed, even in cities, you know, there, there's not been farming there for a while. But now we're buying even more finely processed food, meaning you used to buy a bag of carrots, even if you didn't grow them. Now you buy pre-shredded carrots, right? You're buying food where all of the movement has been done to process it. And then now we buy smoothies, right? We don't have to chew our food anymore. We just suck it down a straw. And every one of those movements uh, has a purpose within our physiology. So when we lose them, we start to see what emerges when we've become really entirely sedentary and not just in steps per day and metabolic reasons, but like, what is not, what are the implications of not chewing your food? What are the implications of not being able to balance or jump? You know, like they start to become liabilities in their own way. Hmm. I talk a lot on this show about the convenience factor and how all these products of convenience are affecting the planet. And I wanted to have a conversation with you today because I can tell through the passion in your voice that you're exceptionally passionate about how products of convenience are limiting our human movement. And so I guess that would be my next question is why as a biomechanist, is it so concerning to you that we're losing all these opportunities for movement that 
his traditionally and historically have been just a part of being a human? Well, I think it's a, for ecological reasons. So, you know, if your kid is in school or maybe you've seen a very simplistic version of the ecosystem, you know, we're usually showing the tangible elements of an ecosystem. You're like, here's the humans, here's the wolves, here's the grasses, you know, like the, the you're, you're looking at things, nouns of what's in the ecosystem. Well, behavior also belongs in an ecosystem. Like when we talk about intact ecosystems, it's not only the, the nouns or the species that they contain, it's the behaviors that are contained. It's the way that they interact with each other. That's also part of um, a healthy ecology. So I talk about, I've written other books where I'm trying to explain, you know, we could talk about all the parts of a television set but if the television set isn't plugged in and there's no electricity flowing for it, it's not a working television set. So the challenge with biomechanics is physical forces are invisible and humans really struggle to deal with invisible things that exist because we're so visually dominant. And it's also, it gets quite complicated when you have to learn the interactions between, let's just say, you know, in a healthy, um, forest that there need to be trees here, but there also need to be carnivores and there also need to be grazers, you know, like there's, and, but the, but it's the way that those interact that's so important. So human movement, when we're talking about climate change, when we're talking about um, vibrant ecology, what we're not, like, we're, we're not naming the biggest elephant in the room, which is most of the waste that's on the planet has to do with our individual steps away from moving for what we need. So even if you just went to cars, what is a car? You know, a car is there to move your body from point A to point B so that you don't have to do what all the humans before you did, which was move their own body to get from point A to point B. So, so much of what like our carbon footprint is, is really, um, it's, it's doing the things that took us more movement. I mean, there's obviously the reason I pause there is because there's, we're also consuming really anything that gives us pleasure. Like we're not really able to say, I'm going to consume things that are more towards my necessity and less for my pleasure or the things that I love. Um, and so our, our, our pleasure seeking is sort of out of hand with just anything that I want, I can bring to me right now um, and look, it's so easy, but there's a, a ton of movement that goes into all of those things. So like the most simple and less shocking, I would say um, example would be like eating out of season, eating out of season. Why don't we eat out of season? Or, I mean, we do, but well, one of the reasons or arguments against it is because it takes so much energy to bring something from the other side of the planet to where you are right now, when there is food around you that you could eat, but you just have a preference for it. So preferences is one part of it, but just to speak biomechanically um, is all of those choices we make have so much movement. So we are not seeing the impact of human sedentarism in the eco chain. We, we, we will call it, and I, this was in the um, afterword of Grow Wild, where I'm really trying to talk about, we, our, our movement is a main part of, all, all animals movement is a main part of the intact ecosystem. And right now we're trying to look at the ecosystem and be like, wow, it's not doing really well, but we're not really looking at how collective mass worldwide collective sedentarism is affecting things. But then we also don't look at how our individual sedentarism relates to massive collective sedentarism. So it's just movement matters in the very direct sense of where we are not stepping, you know, carbon is, you know, like the carbon footprint is replacing literally like our steps or our physical actions.
Yeah, that's a great point. And I thank you for bringing up the, the car example. You don't know this, but the previous episode to this podcast airing before yours is about how we can step back from our cars. Even somebody like me who lives in a super rural area, no public transportation, cars are just such a part of 2021 living. But how can we maybe just take a tiny step back from you know, that convenience? I'm wondering though, as a mom with two children, nine and 10, what do you find <laughs> concerning about the health effects of children who are moving less? Well, I mean, so I, I think I, my foray into biomechanics really was a health centric perspective, individual health centric perspective. And so another reason that I wrote Grow Wild was I had worked with so many adults, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, who were um, suffering physical ailments that related to their, uh, usually like if you go to physical therapy, it relates to your movement patterns, right? You're going to get correctives for the, for the specifics of how you're moving. You know, oh, when you use your arm, you use it at this angle. And when you use it at this angle, only some of the muscles in the shoulder get strong. So I'm going to teach you how to use your arm at a slightly different angle so that you you have a more robust or more better distributed shoulder musculature, which will help that joint. Um, and so I've been doing that for years, decades, but, but early on it was really understanding. It's like, yes, you, your, but your movement patterns are coming from your environment. You know, you, you're still, we're still animals in which we are, our patterns come down from our relatives and then they get promoted in this environment that we set up. And so my, con my concern or my hope was, let me show you how to develop not only better specific movement patterns in the fine motor sense, but, sh but show you how you can have better overall total movement, you know, for metabolic energetic purposes, neurological purposes, but also again, protect your joints for later on. Because I don't think what I was trying to explain to my clients is many of the ailments that you are experiencing right now is the emergence of a pediatric disease. It's the accumulative effect of the development that you had when you were younger. And, you know, they would all say, man, I wish I wish I had known this when I was so much younger. I would have done this when I was younger. But it's like we're all by the time we're 30 or 20, those patterns, a lot of the patterns of movement are set. So I was like, okay, well, let me show you from infant to eight, infant to 12, what you might do as a parent to create a child with a much more robust movement palette. So it'd be the same thing with food. You know, if you just give your kid a very limited amount of food as they're developing, they develop a lifelong preference for these types of foods to the point they really can't palate anything else. So it was just that, it's like I'm going to introduce them to so much movement that they have a, a rainbow, if you will, of ability to um, tolerate and to do well many different movements so that we are, we're setting them up with as robust of a framework going into adulthood, which I wish someone had done for me. And I wish, you know, that, and that if my clients had had more information, you know, a long time ago, what would it look like? So it's, it is definitely to protect health. Movement is one of the um, best things you can do to protect yourself from many different diseases. I'm sure so many parents listening understood the example you gave there with the, the food, <clears throat> right? Excuse me. How many of us have kids who will only eat white pasta with butter, <laughs> right? Um, but I'd love to transition this conversation into how we can facilitate movement opportunities for our children, and more specifically, how we can make our homes um, more movement friendly, especially in the age of COVID, where we're all naturally staying home more, um, the home is our haven, our safe spot, our base. And I want to preface this question of how to make your home more uh, movement friendly by asking you first, I read in your book that you, I believe, tell me if I got this wrong, but you allow your kids to climb on the dining room table. Is that right? 
Well, the, there's a picture of it. So we have lower tables. So there is a picture in the book of my kid doing a handstand uh, on the table with his legs up the wall. It's low, you know, so it's only two feet off of the ground. And so like, I would not have them handstanding during dinner, but that was in a bias check-in section for you to say, for you to be like, how does this picture make you feel? When you see this picture, what's coming up for you? And it dives into you and, and in conjunction with your family to break down, like what actually are the movement rules, explicit and implicit of our home? So I don't discourage, I mean, we definitely have rules around physical behavior in our house, but I wouldn't be very quick to associate, you know, a child exploring a feat of strength or gymnastics in the home environment as something that wasn't allowed. So, you know, I, I don't put a blanket, like no, no big body movements, no, no dangerous movements in the house. Like I don't, I don't have that. It's much more of a nuance um, done in conjunction with the family uh, adjustable to different ages approach to how I do that. So I hear you talking about like innate biases, right? Or biases. Kids shouldn't be, or traditionally in most households, we dissuade our children from doing handstands on the dining room tables. Do you have any tips for parents who find themselves reverting to those cultural biases where we sit at the table with our feet on the ground um, and tables are for eating on, not for doing acrobatics on? I mean, I would love to be a mom who lets their kids climb on the table, but uh, there is something inside me that's holding me back. And I'm sure my listeners are, feel, some listeners might be feeling that way as well. So do you have any thoughts on that? Well, so yeah, I mean, first of all, I think that putting that idea in context is really helpful. So how do you become someone who is, more tolerant of movement in the house has a lot to do with just writing down what comes up for you and, and why you think it does. I mean, I think it requires some self-reflection, like that was a rule in my house. Um, I feel like um, bodies are dirty and shouldn't be on the table, you know, where food is supposed to be clean, you know? So I think that the step one is just to vomit all of those things out so that you can see them. Because sometimes a lot of the thoughts that we have about how things should be relate to things that we haven't even articulated to ourselves. So definitely go through that step. Like that's why those bias check-ins are in every chapter, because I think that it just helps you go like, oh, I, I remember now this moment in which I was severely punished for doing this, or I was told that we're all going to get sick if we do this, or I'm going to break something, you know, like whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second one is don't start with handstands on the kitchen table. Right. So it could be you brought up this um, unique time that we're in where for many people being home is, you know, where they're going to be for another period of time. So I wrote a series of articles just about like, how do you at the beginning of the pandemic, what should your house have in it now that you are all going to be in it more often and you're used to going outside for more movement. And, and this was before the pandemic too, especially for people who lived in really wintry places where there was a whole season of three or four or five months where they're like, my kids just have to be inside all the time because of weather. It's like, well, does your house then facilitate these large body movements that they need? So make a space that's comfortable for you for them to be moving in more. So if it doesn't want to be on the, like, I'm not saying everyone has to be able to do a handstand on the, on their kitchen table but there should be a place where they can do a handstand within the house. So start with that. Like, does that feel comfortable to you? Yeah, okay. You might get footprints on the wall, but also it's like, then we start to look at our relationship with cleanliness and, and, and the hierarchy of cleanliness over physical development, right? So, okay, um, and get yourself a good wall spray. Um, so making a, make a space where, and the, where the children have permission to move. So a big part of the book has to do, we are so good at laying the, all the ways you can't move, all the places you can't move for kids. I mean, kids are inundated with don't move, don't do this type, not the right time. And what we haven't seen is there actually is no more time for children to move anymore. There's no places for them to move anymore. So as we're simultaneously laying down all the 
do not. We're also stressed every day about why our kids aren't moving or getting off the screens or like, we can't figure out how to negotiate this. I'm like, do you have a place for them to move robustly, creatively and with enjoyment? If the answer is no, why would they get off all their devices to go do all the other things anyway? Like they've been shut down from anything else. So make that space, make it in a room. Um, it goes along um, with minimalism quite well because we're so stuff oriented. We've like literally stuffed our houses full of so many things that there is no more space to move without breaking a knickknacks, like some, some by definition non-essential. And we're prioritizing non-essentials over essentials now at this point. We have so much stuff. So collectively with your kids, you know, ask them, like, where would you like to move? What's your most favorite room in the house? What, show me what kind of movements you would like to do in here. And I'll see if we need a mat. You know, you can pick up a, a used bit of flooring to make a cushioned floor, um, like work with them, figure out what they need and know that they're going to change as they get older. Would you like to climb on something? What would that look like for you? Like what are the movements that you enjoy? And then create that space in your house, start there. And then with you examining your biases and rules of the house by co-creating them with your family and by carving out movement spaces and rules about where it is permissive, I think that you're going to overcome that hump and find that um, your kids are able to get more movement mm -hmm. and you and you too. Well, you did a great job offering some suggestions for within the home. And in your book, you gave an awful lot of examples for encouraging movement outside of the home. I might even argue that when we go outside, the opportunities for movement exponentially increase. And so I want to talk to you about your concept of stacking behaviors, because I thought as a mom, that's awesome. So I'm pausing that. But first, I want to ask you, to any parent listening who thinks to themselves or says to themselves, my kid's not an outdoorsy kid. He or she is a book bookworm or a video game star, or they just don't like the outdoors. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts or words of encouragement for them? Well, one, we're all outdoorsy by nature. Like we, we are outdoorsy by nature, um, but your, uh, your comfort, like the, what you're good at has a lot, do, a lot to do with what you've been exposed to. So if you're there, I mean, there's definitely kids that will push that front door down because they're outdoorsy in a way of like, I, no one had to teach me how to love it or to appreciate it. I'm so nature outside centric that I will, inside is dull to me, but we are all outdoorsy by nature. And so for others, um, they're, they're just, more comfortable in the home, you have to do some of the work to get them outside. So it's sort of like, like we tend to see children who are hyperactive as the problematic versus the children who will be still as like, those ones are fine. The ones that are hyperactive are the, have a default or a glitch. When really we could also say that those that are able to be more still for longer are just able to more easily suppress their need to move. You know, we all have different strengths in different ways. And so for the child who you're less like, this kid is just not outdoorsy. It's not enjoyable to them. They're not good at it, that they need more regular exposure, um, that you all could collectively do your more regular exposure together. Um, I think that we are, we've become in this, this convenience is sort of lockstep with like we've become pleasure oriented, like everything has to feel good all of the time. Like we've forgotten the benefits of periods of time that don't feel great or highly stimulating or dopamine rewarding, you know, like that, the idea that you can go out and be nourished. You can be nourished by a plate of food that doesn't excite you or, or um, you particularly enjoy. So it's like, this is just like the vegetables, your, your movement is vegetables. So if you have a kid who's like, the kid doesn't like to eat vegetables, like they just weren't built that way. It's like, well, it has, again, it has more to do with how their palate was laid down originally. So you need to spend a lot of time reintroducing foods in those cases. You know, I think it's like upwards of 30 times for them to readjust their palate with them pushing it away every single time before it begins to transition. Same goes for movement, this idea that 
movement outside. You know, if kids didn't grow up, I, I spent a lot of time in Grow Wild talking about children as trees, as plants, you know? So when you take things that were grown in the greenhouse, plants in this case, and move them outside, they do not do well because the greenhouse is too void of the same loads and experiences that one will find outside. So they fall over, they break branches, it's uncomfortable. It's, it, it's not success making. So there's a period of hardening off that plants need. Children also need hardening off. So for children that are feel best inside, just recognize that they'll need a stepwise approach to be hardened off, so to speak, where they can thrive and be successful outside. Just pushing a kid who's been allowed to spend so much time inside, sedentary, taking in of something still, like I wouldn't expect them to be successful outside. So it's gonna be about dosage in this case. It's gonna be about the activity. It's gonna be about being creative about what are the other things that they like that they can then partake in outside. So if you have a kid who's a Harry Potter fan and can't step away from the book, it's gonna be like, let's make an outside Quidditch game, you know, and, and invite your friends. And we're gonna figure out, we gotta make sticks now. We gotta build stuff. You know, it's, I'm, I try to be really creative and, honor that every human's got their, their flow, the things that bring them joy. But the idea that, but, but you wanna keep in mind the idea that we all need outside, we all need movement. There's not things that um, exclude us from those human requirements, even though they may not be our preferences. Now let's get into stacking. You argue that the key to moving more and the key to getting our children to move more is to stack our lives. What on earth does this mean? Well, stacking, so stacking comes from permaculture. So for those who are familiar with um, that concept of using a permaculture approach to ag versus uh, traditional agriculture, um, it's the idea that nature always gets multiple things done at once. It's, it's a layered, like nature, when you look at how something works in nature, um, it might be raining, but it's raining on top of trees that have all let their foliage down and, and all of those leaves and other detritus that's underneath is part of what holds the moisture in the ground. And those are all just the side effects of the ecology of how everything works together. Well, with farming or gardening, we've cleared everything and we've planted just one crop. So now there's no more leaves that fall all around that hold the moisture in the ground. So we have to water more often. And so when you try to parse out a thing from nature and cultivate it, you've lost, you end up losing a lot of the nuance to the very much older non-human system that got, that got some of the things that you want, but not enough and not in one place. And so multitasking is this idea that we have where like, I'm going to go and do five things at once or three things at once. And you're trying to cycle through all the three things. You're never really giving any one single thing your attention. You're just quickly switching in between each of the three things. So nothing's really being done well for that period of time, or I should say deeply for that period of time. Stacking is this idea of looking for tasks that serve multiple purposes. So rather than trying to do multiple tasks in one period of time, you're looking for a single path task in a period of time, that same period of time that meets more than one need. So in, again, Grow Wild, I lay out the essential needs, the needs that are essential for all humans, all children, humans, and adult humans, because you and your child are trying to get your needs met. Everyone in your community is trying to get their needs met at the same time. This used to happen better in nature because we lived in greater community. We were collectively um, responsible for the group doing well and shared child raising. We shared food production. We shared celebration. And so you didn't have to schedule play dates and schedule exercise and go to the grocery store and do them separately. They all happened at the same time. So it's to call on that understanding of like, this is, this is the more, um, this is, this is the environment in which humans were able to meet so many of their needs for such a long time to kind of harken back to that and try to, to figure out what those tasks would be. So for example, having your friend, your kid and their friends over to figure out how to make a 
Quidditch game outside. Those are play dates. That's their nature. That's their outside activity. That's their movement. And that's their joy, their, their way of like collaborating together. So that would be a way like I would pick that as a single activity to do after school over maybe a sports class where the kid isn't meeting as many of their needs at the same time. It could be, if it's outside, it could be making it more. So it's this idea of like, how do I select for activities, whether they're for the child or for the family that end up um, meeting many of their needs at once? Hmm. I like how you distinguished stacking from multitasking because they're very different. And so thank you for that. (laughs) Two questions left for you. The first is for listeners who are inspired by you and your work and know that their family, themselves and their children are not moving enough. What are a few first steps for them? Start a family walk. Doesn't have to be long. It can be 15 minutes or 18 minutes. So it does not have to be like, um, oh, we should hike together. You know, we need gear. Like it's not, it's not that. It's really to cultivate the practice that you were able to get your children to know how to brush their teeth by repetition, by just laying it down. This is what we do. There's not a, it's not a volunteer thing. It's not because they like it. It's because it's an essential. So think about that walking equivalent to tooth brushing and you can do it early in the morning you could do it midday it all depends on your individual schedule and your your family culture but do it every day whether it's around the block if it's snowing it doesn't matter bundle up you know if it's really hot adjust the time um if someone doesn't feel great you know just roll them along in a wagon you know like whatever whatever it takes you are going to set the stage of this is what we do um yeah, so pick that. And, and also one to recognize that resistance to movement is a very natural phenomenon. So humans are burdened with both the need for a tremendous amount of movement and also um, the genetics to conserve energy. That's, that's what we're struggling with is we've got both of those things going on in our DNA. And so, so that's why the environment is the problem we're not the problem. Sedentarism is the natural side effect to the environments that we have created for ourselves. So you can keep working uphill or you can change something about your environment. So that would be my second tip. How, how are you promoting movement in your house? If you want to exercise more, stretch regularly, do you have your stuff out? Do you have a, a space that's dedicated for movement. And it doesn't have to be a lot. It could be, I've cleared a wall space where my mat sits right there, but I can roll it out and I can just, I know that it's carved for me versus having nothing but chairs and cushiony surfaces that beckon everybody to sit down and just be comfortable. So those would be two great places to start. Start a small walk and, um, and make some space in your house where movement is not only permitted, but encouraged. Katie, this is a really inspiring conversation for me personally. My, I took my kids on a walk yesterday and they complained the whole time and I wanted to throw up my hands and say, forget this, but you know, 30 times for a behavior change you mentioned. So, (laughs) and you're you're on track. You're totally on track. Like, so I do like to tell parents like complaining is natural. Their enjoyment of it does not indicate its benefit. Um, It's really just a transition of habit, like habit change is hard. And if you've ever tried to give up something smoking or drinking or food types or, you know, like, you know, what comes up, they, kids just don't have the filter of going, oh, right. Like this is eventually going to put me on the path that I want. So just let that wash over you and keep on trucking. Keep on doing it. (laughs) Where can my listeners find you and your new book? Nutritious Movement dot com or nutritious movement on social um uh, nutritious movement on youtube is a good place to see a lot of the movements in action and nutritious movement.com is full of articles and very helpful things hours days weeks worth of content Mm -hmm. well quick plug for your new book i loved it i loved every second of reading it and i wish you and your next endeavor whatever it may be the best of luck so thank you so much for coming on thank you All right. Very good. Let me just make sure that I got this all recorded.